In this segment on stem cuttings, we're going to talk about what kind of plants you want to take cuttings from, how you might prepare those plants before you take cuttings, and what kind of environment to put your cuttings in once you've taken them. But first, why even bother? Why propagate by cuttings? Well, there's a lot of benefits, and in fact, stem cuttings are the most common way that plants are propagated in the nursery industry. There are some groups of plants, such as fruit trees, where grafting is more common, but by and large, stem cuttings are where it's at. So here are a few reasons. You can get a lot of plants in limited space. As you can see in the picture here, you can fit quite a few cuttings in a single flat. You don't need that many stock plants to propagate by cuttings, and the stock plant is just your original parent plant. It's the plant you're taking the cuttings from. Um, cuttings are inexpensive and simple, they are fast. You can get a larger plant faster by cuttings than you can by seed. Seed takes a little longer to get a sizable plant. So it's faster, it's inexpensive and simple. Of course, it's a form of asexual propagation, so the plants you get from stem cuttings are going to be uniform. And you don't have to worry about compatibility problems. That's an issue that comes up with grafting because the two plants you graft together have to be compatible. That's not an issue with cuttings because you're just cutting off the piece of one plant. So, what kind of environment do you want to introduce your cuttings into? Well, to start with, you want to make sure you're using the right medium. Now, any good media will serve four major functions. First, and most obviously, the media has to be able to hold the cutting in place. You want it to both provide moisture for the cutting, but also permit air exchange. This is why your media can't be completely saturated with water because if it is, there won't be any air exchange. If you don't have any air exchange, your cuttings will essentially drown and rot. And then finally, you want to reduce light penetration to the cutting base. The cutting base is where the roots are going to form, and that's also where you'll be applying auxin, which is the rooting hormone. Now, auxin is going to break down in the presence of light, so that's why you want to keep the base of your cutting in the dark so the auxin doesn't break down and roots can form. Cutting media usually has both organic and mineral components. So for example, in the picture on the right, you can see a very common cutting medium. And this is what we use in the greenhouses for the plant propagation classes for horticulture majors here at NC State. It contains two components, peat, which is an organic component, and perlite, which is a mineral component. Peat is decomposed portions of sphagnum peat moss. If you go to buy it at the store, it will be in a bag labeled peat moss, maybe even sphagnum peat moss. Not to be confused with sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss does not look like the dark brown substance you see in the picture on the right here. It looks like a light brown, very feathery, fibrous looking thing, and that is a different thing that you use for orchids, not for cuttings. So peat moss is what you're looking for if you go to buy this at the store. It's an organic component, and peat moss holds water very well, so it helps retain moisture. And then perlite is actually made from volcanic rock that has been superheated and expanded into these white, lightweight pellets. So perlite being a larger, coarser particle helps provide drainage in your media. So by mixing peat and perlite together, you end up with a propagation medium that has the ability both to retain moisture, but also to have good drainage and air circulation. So the best of both worlds. People mix these two together in different proportions. In the greenhouse on campus, we use a one-to-one -one peat perlite mix. That means that it doesn't matter what size measurement you use as long as it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you could do that with a solo cup. One solo cup of peat, one solo cup of perlite. For however many solo cups you need, mix it all up, and there you have it. You can also buy something like what you see on the left here, a seed starting potting mix. If you read further on the bag, if you were actually at the store, you would see they recommend it for cuttings as well. Miracle Grow makes some of this, but so does virtually every other potting soil company out there. Brand is not important, but this sort of mix usually works pretty well as well. It doesn't have quite the same proportions of peat and perlite as a one-to-one -one peat perlite mix, and it contains things besides peat and perlite, but it will also do the trick quite well. 
In addition to the media that you use, you also need to control the humidity in your cutting environment and the light. You want as high a humidity as possible to help reduce transpiration. Basically, the whole process of transpiration is fueled by the difference between water concentration in the leaf and water concentration in the air around the leaf. So, if you have a high water concentration in the air, or high humidity, around the leaf, then less water will leave the leaf through the stomata, through those pores into the air. To do this commercially, we use an intermittent mist system like the one pictured here. It comes on every few minutes, sprays out a fine mist for a few seconds, and this will go on usually all day long. What this does is it actually coats the leaves of the cuttings with a thin film of water so that transpiration almost stops. With an intermittent mist system, at least for the area right around the surface of the leaf, you can have 100% humidity. Now at home, you will not have an intermittent mist system most likely, unless you have already advanced quite far into your plant and horticulture hobby and addiction, in which case you might already have one. But if you don't, that's okay. If you look at your propagation assignment for this week, it explains to you how to create a high humidity environment without an intermittent mist system. As for light, we want ample light, but not excessive. You don't want to put your cuttings into full sun. Now, most of you will have your cuttings in your home. This means that you want to put it near a window, but not a window that gets the full force of the afternoon sun shining directly through it. What you want is what we call indirect light. So you want to put your cuttings by a window that maybe gets morning light or where the sun doesn't shine directly through the window. It just sort of passes by the window. In a commercial setting, we control the light levels usually by the use of shade cloth over whatever structure it is that our cuttings are in. Temperature is also important for rooting stem cuttings. First, we want to talk about the temperature of the media. A lot of the time, people just use ambient temperatures for the media. However, it can help to have warm media. We talked about this with the building propagation structures lecture, and we talked about the soil heating cables, the soil heating mats, and how, in particular, hardwood cuttings can benefit quite a bit from a warm media. So if you can get your media to be around 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a great thing to do, especially at home. It's going to help your cuttings root faster. And the picture here just shows a very simple setup for having a heated media. Of course, even simpler than that would be if you had a soil heating mat, you could just put it under the entire structure that you're using to house your cuttings, whether that's a pot with a bag over it or whatever. Now, as for the air, typically you want the air to be a little cooler than or the same as the temperature of the media. You don't want it to ever get too hot. So over 80 degrees is too hot for the air in your cutting environment. The ideal situation for air temperatures for rooting stem cuttings is 70 to 80 degrees during the day and then a cooler night temperature around 60 degrees. Here are some examples again of some very simple structures you can make at home to house your cutting if you don't have any of the structures we talked about in the building propagation structures lecture. On the left here we have the very awesome soda bottle humidity hood. I really like this because you can get empty soda bottles out of any recycling container you happen to pass. This is really convenient for me because in all of the buildings on campus they have recycling bins and they always have lots of two liters in them from various functions where there's been drinks and so I just dumpster dive that, clean it out, cut off the top and boom, I have a humidity hood for cuttings. The nice thing about these two is you can take the lid off if it's starting to get too wet inside. One of the big problems that a lot of students have is they're trying to maintain high humidity, but sometimes it can get so humid that you have a lot of fungal growth. And so if it seems to just be getting totally saturated under your soda bottle top, you can take off the cap and let a little air in there or take off the cap maybe for an hour or two a day. This brings me to something about your media that I should have said earlier. It's really important for your media to be sterile. That's why you can't use soil from outside and you don't want to reuse potting soil that you've used from something else. 
If you buy it from the store in a bag, it's already been sterilized and that's what you want to use. If you have a bag that you've already used for something else but there's some left, you want to make sure that bag's been kept inside and sealed up if you're going to use it for propagation. Propagation is done in a very warm, moist environment, which means it's very good for fungal growth. There are spores everywhere in your home and you just need the right environment for them to grow like crazy. So make sure you're using sterile media, very important. The picture on the right here is another very simple environment. They've simply taken their cuttings in a pot and put them in a large Ziploc bag. This will work just fine for you as well. So moving on from the cutting environment, let's talk about our stock plants. These are the plants we're taking the cuttings off of. You need to pay attention to your stock plant and its characteristics if you're going to have a successful stem cutting. So just like your media should be sterile and free of disease, free of fungal spores, free of insects, you want the same for your stock plant. You want to make sure that the cuttings you're taking are from parts of the plant that are free of disease and insects. If your stock plant looks like it's having a lot of disease and insect problems, you might want to just choose a different one. Your stock plant also needs to be at the proper stage for rooting, and this is different for every plant species. Some plant species will work better if you take the stem cuttings while they're dormant, some while they're actively growing, and we'll talk about that more in the next mini lecture. Now, you may be saying, where can I find these stock plants that I use for cutting materials? Well, the easiest place is in your home landscape, if you have a home landscape, or in your neighbor's landscape, if you have their permission. In a commercial setting, they actually maintain specific stock plants for this purpose at times. And for you, if you want to propagate a lot of plants, you could maintain stock plants as well. The key thing about stock plants is always make sure that you either own it or you have permission from the owner. There's actually a law about it, and I'm going to try to find that and post it for you guys on the website. But Apparently it's against the law to just go randomly take cuttings from landscapes without permission. In general, you want your stock plants to be in good health. This means, first of all, that they are well watered, that they are turgid, which just means firm due to water uptake. Once you take that stem cutting, it no longer has roots, which means it has an extremely limited ability, almost no ability to take up any more water. So if your plant is already under water stress when you take that cutting, it's unlikely to be successful because it's going to be already under water stress and then it's going to continue to lose water as a cutting with no way to take it back up again. So you want your stock plants to be well watered. You want to make sure that they are receiving adequate light. You can tell if your stock plant has been receiving adequate light or not because it should be a nice, thick, dense plant. If it hasn't been receiving enough light, it's going to be very leggy, very long and thin and spindly looking. What happens when you don't have enough light is you get really long internodes. Those are those spaces between the nodes where the buds and leaves are. And if you have long internodes, you have to have a certain number of nodes per stem cutting, usually around two to three nodes. If your internodes are really long, that makes your cutting really long, which is not something you want. And then finally, you want your stock plants to be moderately fertilized. You don't want them to have been fertilized with too much nitrogen recently. The reason for that is nitrogen spurs shoot growth in a plant. It causes the plant to grow more stems and leaves. We want our stem cuttings to be using all their energy for new roots, not new shoots. So if it's your stock plant, make sure you stop fertilizing it around two weeks before you plan to take the stem cuttings. Now the plants in the picture here and on the previous page are my stock plants that I took cuttings from for my research as a graduate student. So how else can you prepare your stock plants for taking cuttings? Well, in some cases, you're going to do some pruning to your stock plant to prepare it for taking stem cuttings. And there's a couple of reasons that people do this. Um, the first is to reduce the number of reproductive shoots in your plant and maintain juvenility. You want vegetative growth for your stem cuttings. You want growth that is stems and leaves, not branches or shoots that are producing flowers and fruits. 
because those usually have a higher level of determinism and they've been utilizing all their energy to produce those reproductive structures, leaving them not that much energy left for the production of adventitious roots. So if you prune the plant continuously, this maintains it in a juvenile stage and reduces the number of reproductive shoots. Sometimes pruning is done to a stock plant to just shape it so that you can take cuttings easier and faster. Sometimes it's done to increase the number of cuttings produced by the plant. If I'm someone that propagates by stem cuttings all the time, I can look at a stock plant like the one in the picture here and tell you how many cuttings I can get off of that. So we can prune in such a way to increase the number of cuttings that we can get off of our stock plant and also to time the flushes of new growth. So with these purposes, there are certain specific types of pruning that can make this happen. The first one is called modified stooling, and though this is not the best picture here, that's what's been done to this plant. Um, with modified stooling, the plant is cut back almost all the way to the ground, and what that does is stimulate lots of new vegetative juvenile growth. It removes a lot of those older reproductive shoots. A good example of this is hydrangeas. Hydrangeas actually have separate vegetative and then reproductive shoots. So modified stooling gets rid of the reproductive shoots and encourages the growth of lots of new vigorous juvenile shoots. In the plant in the picture, that's what's been done to it. You can see where they cut it back to where there's that big knobby growth and you can see also how many new large vigorous shoots are coming out of that. That one has probably been stooled several times over the years. The next type of pruning that can be done to stock plants is hedging, and hedging would be used in that scenario where you're trying to shape your plant for easier and faster collection of the stem cuttings. This is more important for commercial production, but it could be convenient for you as well. Some plants they do this with are barberry, rhododendron, and lilac. If you're familiar with barberry, it's a very spiny plant, so you, if you want to propagate barberry at home, might want to hedge it because if you have to really dig down into it to get cuttings, you're going to get pricked by all those spines. If you hedge it, then it's much more manageable and easy to get cuttings off of. Rhododendron and lilac both get pretty tall, so hedging can keep it shorter where it's easier for you to reach the sound cuttings when you take them. Two more types of specialty pruning. Double pruning involves doing two prunings during the growing season to increase the number of cuttings that you can get from your stock plant. So basically you would prune in the spring. Um, when you cut off the terminal buds of branches, what happens is multiple branches grow out from that same point, and that means multiple cuttings. So double pruning, you prune in the spring, encouraging lots of branching at that time. You take those cuttings and then you prune again at about midsummer, and that encourages a second flush of new growth, which is more cuttings for you to take again. So that's double pruning. Basically, you're just pruning multiple times during the growing season to time multiple flushes of new growth so that you can take those as cuttings. Now, this would only be something that you used for plants that are best propagated by new growth. Not all plants are that way. And then finally, we have girdling. This isn't actually a type of pruning, but it's close. Basically, with girdling, you're stripping the bark off of a stem in a one inch wide strip all the way around the stem, encircling the stem. And that's what you see in the picture here. Girdling is often done with plants that are difficult to root from stem cuttings. So all of the ones listed here, slash pine, sweet gum, and sycamore, are difficult to root. And girdling can help make them easier to root. So they're girdled a couple of weeks before the stem cutting is actually taken. What that does is it interrupts the transfer of natural auxin in the plant from the tips of the branch to the roots. It all sort of accumulates right where you, the girdle is. And so you have an accumulation of the root promoting hormone right there. That's where you cut it off right at the girdle and stick it as a stem cutting. So you already have a good concentration of auxin right there ready to go when you take the cutting. These last few techniques are additional techniques that you can use to increase success with stem cuttings in difficult to root plants. Some plants are going to be really easy to root from stem cuttings and some are going to be quite difficult, some are impossible. So if you have a difficult to root species, one thing you can do is alter how it's exposed to light. If you'll remember, I told you that auxin 
which is the whole key to producing at those adventitious roots, oxen breaks down in the presence of light. So, if you can keep the plant from being exposed to light, at least in part, this helps the natural oxen build up in the plant. Now, I don't want you to be confused about this. Plants naturally produce oxen. They already have it in them. However, most plants will benefit from you also adding synthetic additional oxen as a rooting hormone to the base of the cutting. And we'll talk about that when we get to how to actually take a cutting. So with these techniques on this slide, I'm talking about the natural oxen that's already in the plant. So we have three terms here, etiolation, banding, and blanching. Etiolation is when you have the plant initially grown in 95 to 99% shade. So essentially you put the plant in the closet and grew it in shade for a couple of weeks. This again, because oxen breaks down in the presence of light, will let oxen levels build up in the plant. Then you may take it out of the closet, take your cuttings and stick them. When you do this, it's going to turn sort of a whitish yellowy color while it's being etiolated, but as soon as you expose it to sun again, it will green up. Banding is when you actually, just as the name would suggest, put a band around a portion of the plant to exclude it from light, and that's what you see in the picture here. If you look at the base of the plant, you can see there's a black band wrapped around it. That's to exclude the light from the base, and eventually they'll cut that off as a cutting. Um, this is kind of a weird plant. Imagine that's not just the single stalk of that plant, but a branch on a tree. So you would band where you're going to take the cutting for a few weeks and then come in and take the cutting. That way, again, you have oxen building up in the base of your cutting before you even take it off the parent plant. Often, etiolation and banding are done in conjunction with each other. That's why they're on the same bullet here. So a plant will be grown completely in the shade, then it will be taken out of the shade or out of the dark. The base of where the cutting will be taken off will be banded. Then a couple weeks later, they'll take the cutting. Blanching is very similar. It means that the plant was initially grown in light and then moved into a dark place and then the cutting was taken later. So the main thing I want you to remember about all of these is that they involve growing part or all of the plant in a darkened area for a certain period of time in order to keep oxen from breaking down so that the oxen will then build up in the plant and be there when you take the cutting to help promote adventitious root formation more successfully. Again, this is something you'll only do if you're working with a plant that's really difficult to root. And so with that, we will end this mini lecture.